Okay, so I think, uh, I think we can start now. So um, welcome everyone to this third webinar organized by Triple Eleven and CNCD Triple Eleven on migration and COVID-19. Uh, I am Flor Didden of Triple Eleven, work there as a policy officer migration, and I will be moderating this session today. Um, so I'm very happy to again welcome uh, over 150 uh, people who have registered for this uh, session today. Um, so I think that shows um, that the topic that we're discussing is uh, is of great interest. Um, and so before starting, I want to go to some uh, sh uh, shortly go to some uh, technical um, or practical information. So please, everyone, uh, remain uh, in mute mode. So keep your microphones on mute, um, and also switch off your uh, your cameras if you're not um, if you're not speaking. Then um, for the questions, um, we have the possibility to ask questions to our uh, five panelists um, in the chat box, uh, which you will find on the right. Um, and my colleague Cecile uh, from CNCD Triple Eleven, she will, um, if there are a lot of questions, she will do a selection. Um, so we can uh, have a Q&A in the end uh, of this session. Uh, then the session will be recorded. Um, so we can also uh, share with you um, the recording of this session, um, so you can you can watch it afterwards. Um, and so also our two last sessions in this series, um, our two previous sessions, they are already uh, on YouTube. You can find them on the YouTube channel of uh, CNCD Triple Eleven. Uh, then again, I have to say that uh, so the series is organized by Triple Eleven. Uh, and CNCD Triple Eleven, so the Belgian uh, NGO coalition, you can say, uh, and we organize this together with our working group on migration justice. Um, so together with our member organizations, and here goes a, a special thank you as well to Oxfam uh, Solidarité, uh, Oxfam Solidarité for organizing uh, this specific session together with us. Um, so I guess that was it for the practical information from uh, from my side. Uh, which brings me to the, the topic of today's panel. Um, and so the last two sessions, um, we discussed COVID, uh, the impact of COVID-19 on refugees and other migrants within the European Union. Uh, so today our focus goes outside of the European Union uh, and we will focus on developing countries hosting a large number of refugees and also major countries of transit. Uh, so our focus here will be mainly on refugees um, not losing sight, of course, on mixed migration routes, um, but mainly focus on refugees in North Africa, the Sahel, and the Middle East. Uh, and so I'm very happy with the expert panel around our Zoom table here uh, today. Um, and so we have asked each of our four, but now five panelists to speak for uh, 15 to 20 minutes, uh, ending with two or three key policy uh, recommendations uh, in this field. Um, so that's what we will be uh, discussing, the impact of COVID-19 on refugees uh, in these countries. Um, and I will now immediately start with uh, introducing our first uh, speaker in the panel, who I believe does not need a lot of uh, introduction for a lot of, uh, uh, for most of you. Uh, Mr. Vincent Couchetel is the UNHCR Special Envoy for the Central Mediterranean uh, situation. Uh, he's in that function since 2017. Uh, Mr. Kostel has a long-standing career in the United Nations Refugee Agency. He has been director of the Bureau for Europe uh, at UNHCR, uh, and he has managed UNHCR field offices in, uh, in Central Europe, Eastern Europe, and the Middle East. He has been director of the Resettlement Service and, and so much more. Um, and so we have asked Mr. Kostel to focus uh, his presentation for us today on the situation in Libya. Uh, which is of major concern to a lot of the organizations that are present here today. Uh, but we have also uh, asked him to share um, his analysis of latest developments in the central Mediterranean um, region um, and also along migration routes in uh, Chad and, uh, and Sahel, if, uh, if there is enough uh, time for this. So um, I will immediately pass the floor. Uh, Mr. Kostel, you, uh, you have the floor. Thank you very much, and thank you very much uh, for the invitation to share with you some observation uh, this afternoon on, to all the participants for your interest in this topic. Um, we have developed with the International Organization of Migration a paper on some of the trends that we've picked up early 
during the pandemic on the African continent. So I will share the link to that paper in the chat box later on. What is interesting for us to look is the impact in terms of uh, human mobility, because we believe that this health crisis on the panic around the health crisis has the potential to change human behavior at the individual level, at the family level, and at the community level. What we've seen over the last three months is that movement by land and sea have continued along the routes leading to Libya or the routes leading to uh, Morocco and Spain. Of course, you may look at the numbers. The numbers have increased significantly in terms of departure from Libya, from Tunisia, and from four different countries towards the Canary Island. And the movements have also reduced from, but have reduced from Morocco directly to Spain. So you have plus or minuses when you look at the sea routes. In terms of land routes, well, 43 countries in Africa out of 54 had closed their border. Uh, but the political decision to close border did not need did not lead necessarily to an effective closure of the border. Some of those borders are difficult to control, either because of the geography, either uh, because of some political consideration about population that are very much linked and depending on each other in terms of trade across border. If I had to summarize border closure, I've been stricter on Eastern east horn of African route and on the West African uh, uh, routes. As I said, the, the, the pandemic has not prevented people from uh, necessarily uh, moving when confronted to a conflict. We had had an increase of 33% in the number of people displaced by the conflict in Niger, Mali, Burkina Faso, 33%, uh, person, that means 370,000 people have been displaced by the conflict. I insist on that figure when we, you know, we, we find it difficult in Europe to relocate 425 people. For 370,000 people who were displaced during the pandemic in those three countries in the Sahel. And of course, some of those movements uh, will lead to cross-border movement towards the northern route, Libya and, the, and Morocco or Western Sahara territory, because that's one of the new routes that we have seen opening uh, in March. But it has also led to movement to the south, and we should not forget that. It's the impact of some of those crises in terms of mixed migration is also affecting, and is primarily affecting country in the south. And we've seen a lot of citizens from Burkina Faso displaced by the conflict going to uh, coastal states in, in, in West Africa. Numbers can't be estimated because access to asylum procedure was not possible. Counting at the border was not efficient. So the data is scarce, but those movements have taken place. Now, when we look at other forced movement, we still had some expulsion from Algeria of migrants on asylum seekers towards Niger. We had had mass expulsion by the authorities in Libya, not the government of national accord, but the Libyan uh, national army. So the eastern side of Libya, they have proceeded with a lot of expulsion and it continued again this morning towards Chad, towards Sudan, towards Niger. It affects nationals of those countries, but it, acts, it affects also a third country uh, national. We estimate that about 1,500 people we know of have been returned to those countries but that's probably the visible uh, tip of the iceberg. What we have seen also, I think it's important, the impact of COVID in terms of health situation has been relatively mild, thanks God, in most of the North African country, including uh, Libya, in terms of uh, yeah, health impact. Uh, but of course, the impact is more on, on the economic situation, on the livelihood uh, of people. I'll, I'll leave it to Jane in her presentation because um, uh, the MMC has collected a lot of precise data on the socioeconomic impact on migrants of refugees of the pandemic. Suffice to say that the impact is severe on migrants on, on refugee. It doesn't mean that it will 
lead them to the automatic decision of moving from where they are because we don't know how soon they'll be able uh, to get back a work in the informal sector of the economy where 85% of them are employed. Uh, so how soon they'll be able to get a job, whether the competition will be tougher with nationals of those countries. During the lockdowns, the lockdowns on other measures that uh, restricted freedom of movement, we have seen in some places hostility against uh, foreigners in general. I have to say also in all honesty, we have not been a, a tremendous spike in terms of xenophobic uh, incidents. We've seen expulsion of migrants and refugees in Libya, in Tunisia in particular, in Algeria also because they could not pay their rent anymore. Uh, but it's, it's very difficult to assess on a large scale uh, whether uh, those problems uh, will continue over the weeks to come. There's been also, of course, an, an impact on access to education. On access to education in many developing countries doesn't mean not only depriving people from access to learning, it means depriving kids to access to one meal a day. Uh, and we know, unfortunately, from experience from other situations and other comparable crises than when girls in particular stop going to school, then they don't return to school afterwards. So risk of exploitative uh, practices, early pregnancy, uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, post-COVID. In terms of aggravating factors, we have to see that the COVID-19 uh, uh, unfortunately took place in a situation where we are facing on the African continent a serious problem in terms of food security. Uh, we have 12 countries, 37 million people uh, affected because of conflict. We have 20 countries, 20, 60, 26 million people affected because of weather extremes or the locust uh, uh, infestation on Eastern Horn of Africa. Other aggravating factors include uh, security deterioration group in particular in the Sahel using the pandemic uh, to spread more distrust of the government. We've seen a lot of government also using human rights der derogation uh, abusively using the pandemic uh, to impose restriction, to postpone elections, uh, so creating uh, more risk of social disorder in a number of countries. When you look at the landscape in Africa, we will have 15 crucial elections in a number of fragile countries before the end of the year, and there is a risk of turbulence in many of those countries. For humanitarian actors, if I zoom at the situation in Libya, we were forced to uh, provide food uh, to people who had lost their jobs. We had to suspend all evacuation and resettlement of refugees. Our partner IOM had to suspend voluntary uh, repatriation flights to country of origin. And if I look across the continent with a few exceptions, uh, caused by turbulence in Burkina Faso and in Burundi. Uh, we had very little repatriation, uh, except to those two countries. Uh, so this is, this is a problem because also some of the people who want to return to their place of origin. So what will be the main two drivers in terms of movement, either from Libya to neighboring country or from Libya uh, by sea to Europe? or in terms of movement towards Libya in the, in the months to come. I think the number one factor is reduced livelihood. How long will that last? I think another element is psychological, is the despair. We've seen it during the migration crisis in 2015, the, the loss of hope, in particular the loss of hope to go back home, the loss of hope for sustainable peace, when it is coupled with reduced access to livelihood can be a trigger for movement, even if people are in a dire economic situation. Now, there are, of course, some variables because for people to move across border, south to north or south to south, um, 
funding has become a problem. The diaspora do not have the same support capacity at this stage. Uh, the remittances have dropped during the COVID period from Europe to Africa by a minimum of 23%. That's the estimate of the World Bank. For some countries like Somalia or Mali, it's, it's more. For Libya also, it's more. So the people don't have the capacity to purchase smuggler services to move on. For the first smuggler, the business needs to be profitable to continue. And that depends also, of course, of the degree of impunity uh, they enjoy. In terms of uh, other consequences, it's also uh, unfortunate and at the same time understandable. The domestic agenda of many donor countries, and it's not just Europe, is going to be so huge on the, on the economic recovery that there will be certainly less funding uh, for development on humanitarian action. So that will force us to prioritize. And we all agree that food security is a priority, but it can't be the only one. Now, in terms of policy recommendation, I think I'll concentrate on, on one, uh, which is there'll be a number of European African uh, frameworks to be discussed during uh, the rest of the year. One is the post Cotonou agreement, on, it's on trade, but not just on trade. Another one is the revision of the Valletta Joint Plan of Action. The, the Valletta Joint Plan of Action. Some European states and some African states. It's not it does not provide a miracle recipe in all areas, but it was balanced around five different pillars. Unfortunately, our perspective is that Europe has spent more on return, on border control, than on root causes, on building protection, on, on developing legal pathways. And that's going to have to be one of the priority of Europe. When you look today at the demographics of movements from Africa, including North Africa and Libya to Europe, I mean, it's not, it's not gender neutral. The proportion of women getting access to protection in Europe is extremely limited. So what does that mean? I think we need to look at what have been some of the lessons learned during that crisis. Uh, indeed, there are lots of question marks on which I'm not an expert about, yes, the need for migrants, skilled, semi-skilled migrants that economies in Europe need. When do we start? I mean, some promises were made in Valletta. Those promises have not yet been turned into programs of either circular migrations, seasonal migration, or longer-term migration. The second point is going to be for refugees, and that's more my area of expertise. Unfortunately, I do not expect much progress on resettlement by states, but we would like states to authorize on a pilot basis in more places community-based resettlement. Uh, that crisis has also demonstrated the capital for solidarity in European, in, in African societies. And we should be able to unleash cooperative agreement to develop private sponsorship resettlement, vetted by state on the security side, but to make really a real push there. Along the same line, lifting the restriction introduced on family reunion in 2015 would be important for us. Family reunion brings better integration in Europe. It brings better protection for women and children. And it's a win-win. It also uh, cuts in the business of the in, in dangerous journeys. So we hope that European states will be wise enough to engage with the African partner in a true st spirit of partnership when it comes to the revision of that uh, joint Valletta plan of action. I leave it here. I could name another 20 recommendations, but I want to leave time to the other speakers on four questions. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Kostel. Um, so many interesting points uh, to take from, uh, from your presentation. I note uh, the striking figure of 370,000 people displaced during the pandemic uh, in the Sahel, which, which posed another perspective on, on the numbers that we're discussing today uh, in the European Union. 
when it comes to uh, disembarkation of, of migrants in, uh, in the Mediterranean area uh, and a lot of the risks that you pointed at. So um, I, if, if we talk about, uh, you talked about the suspension of uh, relocation, resettlement and, and other humanitarian programs, the drop in remittances of uh, 23% for African countries and some countries even more like Libya. Um, you talked about less funding uh, from European member states and, and other donor countries, uh, which pose a lot of uh, threats, I think, for, uh, for refugee protection in the coming months. But then you also pointed uh, to some very interesting uh, policy recommendations and some interesting um, processes uh, like the frameworks of Post Cotonou uh, and the Valletta Action Program. So I think a lot of the organizations that are here uh, listening today are working on these processes. So a lot of work has, has to be done there. Um, and there I take uh, the importance of legal pathways, uh, not only for refugees, but also economic migrants um, to, to European countries. They're working on root causes and not only limiting focus on, on returns, as perhaps has been too much the case uh, in, in the latest uh, negotiation rounds in, in these processes and frameworks. Um, and then, of course, uh, the importance of taking also the gender perspective into account in all of these uh, measures. So thank you so much uh, for that. And then uh, and, and you ended also with uh, the more refugee focused uh, recommendations, private sponsorship and a family reunification. So I think these are very uh, important points you make, and that uh, this is some. These are some issues that a lot of the, the NGOs like uh, like mine uh, will be working on in the next uh, in the next weeks and the next months. So uh, thank you so much for that. And I see that there are also uh, already uh, some questions in the in the chat box uh, for you. So please uh, please stay around uh, for the Q and A in the end of uh, of this session. Um, but now uh, we will shift our focus a bit. Uh, we will now go um, to the Middle East, uh, to Lebanon more specifically. Um, and for that, we have Noor uh, Lekkerkerker, who is uh, head of advocacy at Basma and Zaituna. Um, for the people that don't know uh, Basma and Zaituna, Basma and Zaituna is uh, an organization that started as a group of volunteers in support of Syrian refugees in Lebanon. Um, today, the organization serves uh, thousands of Syrian individuals in Lebanon with more than 200 uh, staff members and volunteers, and recently also uh, started working in, in the south of uh, Turkey. Uh, Basma and Zaituna is a partner organization of uh, Triple Eleven as well, um, and Noor will share with us the latest developments uh, on Syrian refugees, the impact of COVID-19 uh, on Syrian refugees in Lebanon. Uh, so Noor, please go ahead, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, thank you very much anyway for giving me the time to speak a little bit about the impact of COVID-19 uh, indeed on Syrian refugees in Lebanon. I'm going to speak about uh, the humanitarian impact of the COVID-19 crisis and speak a little bit about um, uh, Nor you seem to have you seem to have a, a, a small connection problem, and is it possible also to to get a, a louder volume? Um, can you hear me now? That's better. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, the connection in Lebanon, as many know, is a little bit flaky. So please tell me when uh, when you can't hear me well. So I was just saying that my third point will focus on the localization of the COVID nineteen response and also challenges that. Um, we as Pressman Zetuna and other local organizations face. I'm going to uh, end with a few policy recommendations as well. So I think in order to explain to you the humanitarian impact of COVID-19, um, I think it's important to know a little bit about the background in Lebanon. Currently, Lebanon is going through its worst financial crisis since the civil war. There is a soaring unemployment um, Lebanon defaulted on its eurobond payments and has to restructure an extremely high debt. There are cash shortages in the country, there is an ingress aggressive inflation, prices of basic goods are surging, a new government was installed only a few months ago, uh, and official statistics forecast that 45% of the Lebanese population are set to live in poverty in 2020. 22% of which in extreme poverty. So these are all very concerning uh, developments. Then Lebanon was already the country with the largest per capita refugee population of the world. 
uh, the Syrian influx uh, has had an enormous impact here. As many of you probably know, there's also a Palestinian refugee uh, community in Lebanon. Uh, the, the country has a pretty fragile sectarian political system, a painful history with neighboring Syria. Uh, so I think this, these are all uh, circumstances that are important to know uh, in order to really understand the impact of COVID. Um, on the one hand, the number of cases of uh, COVID-19 and the number of deaths in Lebanon are relatively low compared to the countries that were badly affected by the crisis. As of yesterday, there were 30 deaths and 1,368 uh, known cases. Uh, however, the fragile health system will not be able to cope with a large uh, number of, um, of infections. So it's, it's worrying, especially if none, none of us know how the COVID-19 will, uh, will further develop. And the humanitarian impact of the lockdown measures that started here in Lebanon on the 18th of March and uh, the resulting temporary closure of all non-essential businesses have been absolutely catastrophic. In Lebanon, there is a very high dependency on daily and irregular labor um, by Syrian refugees, but also by Palestinian refugees and by vulnerable Lebanese alike. Very few people have social protection and there is no unemployment compensation system. Uh, Basma Zaytuna, indeed, also with Triple Eleven and with a number of other organizations has set up a project called the Refugee Protection Watch. This project uh, aims to monitor and advocate for the protection of refugees in Lebanon and across the region. And in order to assess the impact of COVID-19 um, on vulnerable communities in here in Lebanon, we did a survey. We started it just after lockdown had started. And by the 21st of April, so a month after the lockdown was implemented, 80% uh, of our 430 respondents and even 84% of all Syrian respondents stated that their income had been severely reduced or completely disappeared. All areas of Lebanon seem to be equally affected by job and income losses. And of course, the survey that we did is not the only study that has been done, uh, but our findings are in line with other findings. Despite things opening up a little bit again, um, a lot of people, a lot of vulnerable people that had lost their job due to COVID-19 have not been able to return to the work or have not been able to return, sorry, to uh, obtain the same income uh, as they did before, uh, before the crisis. So a few results of this enormous income loss uh, are, for instance, high rates of food insecurity. Uh, um, this is a little bit in line with uh, what we heard in the first presentation. There are people that haven't had hot meals for days for many families, it's about choosing whether they want to serve a proper meal, one proper meal a day, or keeping, for instance, their internet connection, which enables them to get very valuable information, which is also very important in a, in a crisis uh, like this. There is also an increased risk of forced eviction. Uh, this was already a risk in Lebanon for Syrian refugees, but now with many being unable to, to afford the rent, this risk has increased. There is an increase of uh, protection risks, especially for people with special needs that are now not able to access the services they need, uh, but also an increase of gender-based violence, domestic violence, um, and all those uh, related protection risks are on the increase. Um, as, uh, as I just said, the enormous rates of unemployment and the desperate situation that many uh, people find themselves in both Syrians and Lebanese uh, really can, can uh, result in, in a rise of tensions. A loss of education, already 44% of Syrian uh, school aged children were out of school, but now especially those that were enrolled in public schools have uh, a fewer chances of receiving any online guidance at home and a lot more children are also forced to work uh, in order to help make ends meet. And then, as I already briefly mentioned, uh, feelings of extreme desperation and hopelessness. Um, in my organization, we've come across several cases of people putting themselves on fire out of protest or committing suicide because there is just no solution inside for many people. The second uh, point I want to talk about is about discrimination and stigmatization. Um, as was also mentioned in the first presentation, COVID-19 provides governments around the world 
and thus also in Lebanon, the possibility to restrict movement, to suspend and control gatherings, uh, to further decrease the space for civil society and civic action, and also to implement um, more stringent restrictions on the freedom of movement of Syrian refugees. So according to a Human Rights Watch uh, report, at least 21 Lebanese municipalities at some point introduced discriminatory restrictions on Syrian refugees that do not apply to Lebanese residents. Uh, that means, for instance, that Syrian refugees were only able to go out three hours a day, whereas the Lebanese uh, residents were able to, um, to move around the entire day except between 7 p.m. and 5 a.m. Uh, in the morning, which was the curfew that was applied to the entire country. Syrian refugees have been threatened with things uh, such as the confiscation of their identity documents in case they breach the rules, uh, which uh, would only exacerbate an already huge problem with access to legal residency for Syrian refugees in Lebanon. So we can say that these restrictions and measures have now dwindled down. If the country is more open, a lot of those restrictions have been lifted. However, we should really keep an eye on such issues because, as said before, we don't know uh, maybe a surge in cases will also mean a surge in those kinds of restrictions again. Then Syrians have reported uh, to us and to many other actors in Lebanon fears of stigmatization and discrim uh, sorry, discrimination when accessing health services. In spite of the government of Lebanon stating that all Syrians will also be treated in case they contract COVID-19. But Syrians who have had a rather difficult relationship with authorities in Lebanon um, and especially since so many Syrians are undo undocumented suddenly have to trust authorities to not arrest them or deport them or further discriminate them uh, which is of course a very difficult dynamic. Also until COVID-19 started um, there was still depor deportation to Syria on ongoing based on uh, a decision by the Higher Defense Council um, the deportation of Syrians uh, directly breached, it was a violation of the commitment of non refoulement because these Syrians that were deported had no access to legal redress and were returned to a country that is clearly not safe and ready for the return of, of Syrians yet. The last point I want to I wanna emphasize here is that a lot of Syrians also uh, experience barriers to access health services. This can be different things. Uh, as said, it can be the fact that they're undocumented and thus cannot pass uh, checkpoints or don't want to pass by authorities on the way to health services out of uh, fear for arrest or even worse, deportation. Uh, but also, is there a lack of public transportation in some cases? Can a lot of Syrians not afford the high costs of public transportation? Um, and, and, and these kinds of things. Um, when it comes to access to information, uh, I want to stress that it's extremely important that everyone has equal access to information during a crisis like this. The survey that I just described that we as Fasim together with our partners did um, indicated that a month after the lockdown was introduced, 42% of our respondents still did not know which hotline to call in case they suspect having contracted the virus and 38% of our respondents indicated they wanted to receive more information. Uh, so with all our respondents, we send this information, but this is, a, this is definitely something we need to keep an eye on. Um, because also, as, as I said before, some people have um, just uh, don't have in access to internet anymore because they prefer having food on the table rather than having uh, an internet connection. The third and last point that I would like to talk with you about is the localization of the COVID-19 response and the challenges that we face in that. So the case for Basman Zaytuna and for many other actors in Lebanon is really balancing between, first of, on the one hand, responding to the current crisis, um, extreme needs for, for food, for cash assistance, for hygiene products, while on the other hand, the protection issues that were at stake in Lebanon remain to be at stake. So we also should not forget the also urgent but non-COVID related humanitarian and developmental needs and protection concerns. And what is also really important is to focus on, already look ahead, 
for instance, economic recovery of communities post-COVID and ensuring that everyone, also all Syrian refugees, will have access to the vaccine, uh, vaccination once it's there. The role of local actors is extremely important here, uh, given their continuous engagement with marginalized communities. So often the levels of trust that is built between them and the local communities and therefore these local actors' capacity to, inter to uh, design uh, sustain, uh, sorry, suitable interventions, as was, for instance, shown in the Ebola crisis as well, the importance of local actors and not just the presence of international agencies. Also, local actors have a commitment to stay committed to the cause and to stay in country. Um, for instance, uh, ourselves, but many others with us, are really committed to the Syrian cause and will not let go of this cause until, until it's solved. And the third and last thing would be uh, the ability to negotiate with local authorities. Uh, we've had to do a lot of negotiation with municipalities. Uh, uh, municipalities here in Lebanon would demand that distributions would only benefit Lebanese communities, while we as President Zetouni are committed to a needs-based uh, way of working so um, we cannot leave our vulnerable Syrians because we want to serve everyone uh, that is in need. A few of the challenges that uh, local actors face, and I think that really need to be solved in order to ensure that these local actors can play a key role in the COVID-19 response and in general in the, in the Syria response, um, is that often we need get an approval in order to change the target or we need an official approval in order to um, change our way of working. And right now what we need is the flexibility to, to really uh, adjust quickly. Uh, as, as you can imagine based on what I just told you is that the situation in Lebanon is extremely volatile. Finding supplies is difficult. Prices can change from one day to the other and it's thus key that we can quickly respond to such changes. And one other very important thing is that uh, a lot of the aid workers, especially if they're Syrian aid workers, and Basman Zedunia, for instance, is a Syrian-led organization who employ both Lebanese and Syrian staff, but a lot of these staff don't have access to healthcare themselves. So these people provide life-saving assistance, uh, not only in health, but also in terms of food distributions and uh, all types of other uh, interventions in case these, these aid workers themselves will contract the virus um, they may not have access to healthcare. so it's extremely important that also uh, staff protection and risk management is included in grants so that we can take care of our staff so that the staff can continue to take, take care of, of beneficiaries um, i'm looking at the time and i will move to the recommendations um, as some of you might know, um, at the end of June, the Brussels Core Conference on the Future of Syria and the Region is coming up. This is a key moment where all stakeholders involved in the Syria response come together this, time, uh, this, this year virtually and uh, to put on the agenda important things for donors to, to make pledges and to stay committed to the Syria crisis. So we are working very hard to uh, prepare documents and recommendations for this, um, for this, this conference. Um, so I'm just gonna share with you a few recommendations um, and I'm happy to discuss other recommendations after this webinar. Um, so one very important one is that donors should ensure sufficient funding for food, health, hygiene and cash assistance, as well as other aid and support in response to COVID-19. This support should be available without discrimination between refugees, other vulnerable migrant communities in Lebanon, and vulnerable Lebanese communities, and it should be based on needs. So priority should never be given to specific nationalities, uh, sorry, nationalities, sects, or religions. And this support also includes access to testing and access to treatment for COVID-19, and in the future, access to a vaccine. What we also see very important here, uh, especially with Tuna, is to invest in the agricultural sector in Lebanon. It is nearly the only productive sector uh, left in Lebanon, but the sector is really suffering from the lack of input supplies. Um, so we need to, to act fast in investing. Um, 
Also, agriculture is one of the few sectors that refugees are actually allowed to work in because uh, Syrian refugees aren't allowed to work except in three sectors, agriculture, construction, and cleaning services. The funding that I just mentioned should be flexible and should be longer term and should uh, allow for overhead costs and should be available for and accessible by local NGOs and local actors too. Like I just explained above uh, or previously, allowing these local actors to play a key role in the battle against COVID-19. And, and also allowing these local organizations to invest in risk management, in procedures for safety, um, and to ensure that their own staff remain healthy and safe as well. Um, in addition, uh, civil society actors and local organizations should also be included in every step of the planning and preparedness uh, for the COVID-19 response. Uh, then another important recommendation is that um, the emergency response to COVID-19 is extremely important, but it should not result in the backsliding of uh, addressing longer term protection concerns and human rights violations um, that were there and will remain to be there. And that are also actually key to addressing someone without access to, uh, to legal residency or someone without access even to, to healthcare, to any of its human rights will not be able to to battle COVID-19 either. So in that regard, it's also very important that the government of Lebanon and other stakeholders communicate very clearly that testing and being diagnosed with COVID-19 uh, does not result in the arrest or deportation of Syrian refugees, even if they're not documented. Then at the same time, the deportations that were taking place until the borders closed, the borders between Lebanon, Lebanon and Syria are still closed as of today, but once they open, deportation should also not resume. Um, those summary deportations should be halted for, for once and for all. Um, the last recommendation I want to make is more in general about refugee protection. Um, of course, uh, with current circumstances deteriorating in Lebanon and deteriorating for a while, even before COVID, uh, we are very scared that uh, these negative conditions, these very poor conditions in Lebanon can act as push factors, pushing Syrians back to Syria prematurely when they're not ready in the face protection risks there. So we think it's very important that uh, it's well understood that Syria currently is not a safe destination of return. And any return that takes place should be safe, voluntary and dignified and informed and be based on the personal uh, decision made by the individual refugee involved. So yes, people have the right to return, but the, the conditions in the country are not conducive for any large scale return. Um, I'm going to leave it at this. I'm very happy to discuss more uh, after the webinar as well. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Noor, for sharing uh, your, uh, your updates on the latest developments uh, in Lebanon and also uh, your analysis on, uh, on based on um, own data collection uh, among Syrian refugees there. So that's uh, that's very interesting project. I think the, the Refugee Protection uh, Watch uh, some interesting other points I take uh, are the um, just the background on on uh, the difficult situation already uh, existing for a long time before uh, the arrival of the pandemic in Lebanon. So I think that the pandemic is only stressing some of the vulnerabilities that were there uh, already long beforehand. Um, you pointed out to the mainly economic um, impacts of of the pandemic on job income. Uh, for a lot of people, but also on the access to education uh, that became harder. Um, a point that was made already by uh, Mr. Kostel on the risk of governments uh, using this pandemic to pose extra restrictions on refugees as something uh, to uh, to counter, and then the need for uh, for information, access to information uh, on on the pandemic, um, and the importance to um, to have local actors uh, to support local actors uh, in all of this. Uh, you pointed to another uh, important process that um, or framework that uh, that deserves our, our attention and follow up, uh, which is the Brussels conference uh, end of June, um, and the importance of uh, flexible funding and, and also to to include local actors uh, to have access to these uh, to these forms of funding. 
Um, and then the last point, uh, I think a very important point as well made on um, the risk of premature returns um, and the need to put, uh, put more stress on uh, safe, voluntary and dignified uh, returns and to have, to have more uh, mechanisms in, in monitoring that. Uh, so thank you so much, Noor, for, uh, for all this uh, information. Um, and that now brings us to, um, to the situation in um, Jordan. Um, so we just had the news this morning that uh, the speaker uh, from Oxfam that we had in mind, uh, Mr. Uh, Sioban McGrath, uh, could not make it today due to uh, an illness. Um, but luckily, uh, Oxfam found uh, uh, two persons to, to replace uh, Mr. McGrath, uh, which are um, Kasim Kasim, who is uh, Oxfam camp manager in uh, Zatari camp in Jordan, uh, and Jean-Patrick Perrin, who is a policy uh, and media manager for Oxfam in Jordan. Uh, so both uh, of them have uh, agreed to speak to us today on the situation in Jordan. Um, so I don't know uh, who of you will, uh, will first uh, take the floor, but uh, please go ahead. Thank you, and uh, I'm Jean-Patrick Perrin, so I will start uh, our intervention and I will soon give the floor to my colleague Kasim. Um, so first off, yeah, again, please accept all the apologies from our colleague Siobhan uh, because she's ill and she's not able to uh, join this webinar today. Uh, but she'll make sure that we'll be, you know, able to give you a good overview of the impact of the crisis in Zaatari camp specifically. As for myself, um, oh, apologies. Yeah, and apologies also. I, can, I would, if at all possible, I would not use to turn my video on because I had lagging problem during uh, Noor's and Mr. Koshtel's intervention. So um, I will, I will stay, <laughs> I will stay without the camera on. Okay, that's okay. Apologies. So I will, I will start by giving you. Um, uh, so we will focus our, our um, intervention on the impact on refugees in Zaatari Uh But I will start by giving you a broader overview of the impact of COVID-19 here in Jordan. Uh, because, and that very much echoes what Noor was saying for Lebanon, um, you cannot dissociate the impact of COVID between refugees and Jordanians because all of them are very much impacted by the crisis and the Jordanian economy as a whole. Um, so there is no holistic data really available at the moment in Jordan, but we do have, you know, ideas based on the different needs assessment that have been conducted by UN agencies, by NGOs, by the government of what the impact has been so far. But so basically you need to remember that Jordan, um, Jordan economy has been suffering for more than a decade now, uh, either because of the late 2000 economic crisis, all because of the different conflicts that have been affecting the region for the past two decades, whether you're talking about the war in Iraq or the war in Syria, um, both of them being key economic partners for Jordan for export. Um, you also need to remember that the, the labor market in Jordan is getting more and more affected by the economic downturn as a whole and is being increasingly relying on informal labor, whether this applies to Jordanian workers or foreign workers, refugees that are allowed to work, non-registered refugees and migrants that are also working informally. And as of today, more and more people are working informally, which means little to no social protection whatsoever. And for, as a result, um, as an impact of COVID, less and less people, if they were to get the virus while not having social protection, would not, those, these people are not able to uh, seek basically treatment or quality treatment for COVID-19. Um, so when you look at the situation today in Jordan, you have only just above 800 confirmed cases of COVID. And it is fair to say that the virus is at the moment more or less contained uh, because Jordan in the early days, uh, basically around mid-March started one of the harshest and the most strict uh, confinement measures in the world. and that is understandable considering that because of what I was saying before about informality um, and also because Jordan being you know heavily impacted by hosting um, a couple million refugees whether they are Syrians, uh, Palestinians and other refugees from other countries from Sudan, from Somalia 
um, from Iraq and Yemen as well. Um, basically, the pressure on socials on public services has been huge over the past decade or so, and therefore, if the outbreak wouldn't be controlled from the onset, uh, the health system would not have been able to cope with a pandemic that will be greater than what we're experiencing today. Um, as far as Zaatari camp is concerned, uh, Zaatari is obviously impacted and one of the most you know, vulnerable places to COVID-19 in Jordan. Um, but that so far hasn't turned into uh, a worrying situation because there hasn't been any comfort cases in Zaatari camp. Uh, based on the testing that have been conducted by the government uh, several times. Yet, you have to remember that the housing conditions are, are cramped in Zatari camp. Um, an average household is five to six people, and more often than not, a family will sleep in, you know, in the same room within the caravans in the camp. So it's extremely difficult for refugees in Zatari to observe to self-isolate if they were to get sick, or to observe social distance, uh, distancing measures inside their own households. Now, most of the impact, and I will give now the floor to Kassim to give you more details, but so, so far the, the biggest impact has been obviously um, on the social economic side. And we've seen that through our own programs that we run, through cash forward programs, and based also on surveys that we've been conducting like other organizations. Kassim, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, JP, and hello, everyone. As uh, JP has mentioned, the government of Jordan has decided, has decided to take very restricted measurement and uh, starting of uh, the crisis. One of these measurements was to lock down all the camps in uh, Jordan, and I will speak specifically on Zatari camp. Well, when they closed down, they prevented the cash for the, they prevented the Syrian refugees from leaving the camps. Usually, the Syrian refugees living in Zatari camp they used to leave uh, Zatari camp to work outside in the surrounding farms and uh, Mafra Gabarnare. But when the government has Locked down the camp, all the, all the refugees came back to Zahtari camp uh, currently. In Zahtari camp, there are 4,000 active incentive based volunteering uh, opportunities are provided by different agencies in Zahtari camp on a monthly basis. These numbers are down from 7,000 opportunities in December 2017, and the total active cases registered at the moment. 15,600, meaning these figures mean that only 25% of registered cases in Zahtari are able to find jobs. And with the, with the lockdown, you have all these people came to Zahtari and with, with, this, num with this limited number of uh, jobs, it significant, significantly affected the job opportunities NGOs are providing. Oxfam currently we provide around 700 uh, paid volunteers on a daily basis. These jobs include security guards, lit litter pickers, uh, solid waste collectors, supporting all our operations in Zahtari camp. However, over the next three years, Oxfam will be facing annual reduction in number of IBV positions due to the different Changes in donor funding priorities and they favor long term intervention. These jobs, uh, the, these numbers I mentioned, these jobs are really essential for the, the refugees as it is the main income for the families since the government has locked down the camp. And inside the, inside the Zahtari camp, you refugees are working. Are, so uh, the, the basic need livelihood the working group has decided to continue paying the, the cash for workers regardless if they had worked or not during this pandemic, uh, just in a way to reduce the impact on, uh, on the families living in Zahtari. One, another indicator of uh, how the COVID-19 has affected the Zahtari camp uh, usually, we advertise. We usually we advertise position 
uh, we advertise one position, we receive around 100 uh, applicants for refugees willing to, to join our cash for work, our incentive-based volunteering. But recently we have seen a significant increase of the application. Uh, the team has advertised the role of uh, trolley worker, the number of applications we received around 700 application. We also had uh, 450 people apply for several roles in, moni in monitoring water pumping. These numbers, the, uh, the, the increase, the, the, the increase and the, on the, the demand on the cash for work opportunities has, we have seen an increase on the demand of the cash for work opportunities in Zachary. Worth also to mention, people, uh, refugees in Zachary are facing uh, challenges and in, in the price increase of the products in the market. Uh, some refugees has expressed a uh, challenge in accessing online education platforms established by the government of Jordan as they were required to have a smartphones and internet subscription to be able to access these the platforms and some families has more than one child registered in uh, in a school, so it would be very difficult for them to for for the children to study if you have two three children to study at the same time. Uh, yeah, uh, JP, over to you again uh, to show us uh, to give us a detailed information on the last RNA conducted by Oxfam. Yes, thank you, Kassan. So, in addition to the so, in addition to the impact that Kassan was describing on people that uh, work with Oxfam on cash for work slash incentive based volunteering programs, um, you also there's there's also something that is not always um, known, you know, outside Jordan or outside that for for people to focus on on the response to the Syrian crisis is because people were normally allowed to go work outside of camp and, and even though the, work, the number of work permits that are issued for people in that camp are limited. Uh, so these people were not allowed to access work outside of camp for legal work. And people, whether they hold the work permit or not, can also one way or the other try to find work informally outside of camp. And so those people were not able to make any income uh, for a period of about two months. So, that has been a massive problem. And so when you look at the, the need assessment that we conducted recently in the camp and also more broadly in the uh, host communities of Zagreb, one of the key uh, responses that we got was for the camp that about 90% of the respondents that we interviewed had cash saving that would only last for two weeks at the most. Meaning if these people were not getting any, you know, vouchers, uh, food vouchers, cash support from WSP, uh, from other NGOs, if the salaries that they would normally get for cash for work programs were not given to them, whether they were able to work inside the camp or not, uh, the situation would have been a lot, lot worse for them uh, than, than it is now. And even though currently at the moment, the situation is clearly not ideal. Um, about about 70% of people, household that we interviewed also told us that yes, because of COVID-19 and the lockdown that happened for the camp, 70% uh, of respondents told us that they had to make choices um, to, as to how they would you know, use the money that they have, as in they had to prioritize certain things, access to you know, paying for food, uh, paying for items, 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 for example, but they had to deprioritize other things at the same time. Um, for cash for work, so for a certain period of time, for several weeks and almost two months as well, um, all INGOs running cash for work program are not allowed to um, use the same rotations of volunteers as we normally would. You know, every three months we would have rotations for a single position every three months or a bit more depending on the nature of the position. That's, that was not, most, for most positions, that was not for, possible for Oxfam and other INGOs to do. And so now you also, in addition to having more people applying for jobs inside the camp, you also have an increasing number of people who've been waiting for their rotation because they were on the rotation list for cash for work before the lockdown was declared. And so these people are not necessarily able to get any money from the cash for work. 
during lockdown. Um, the main concern of the people that we interviewed was, and that was the, f the first one and by a huge margin, was 77% of people that we interviewed said, we are worried about accessing cash. Because that, whether that gives them, you know, an additional income to be able to, for people who are, you know, normally working at the same time, but that, you know, um, sorry, apologies, that are getting vouchers and, and cash distribution, those cash forward position would give them an additional income to provide for the family, or that would be, that could also be the main source of income for them. And so people are worried about this at the moment in the camp. And so slowly now with the easing of the curfew and everything, things are improving, but it's going to take, you know, time for refugees in the camp to go back to normal in terms of financial stability. Also knowing that more often than not, uh, people cannot, you know, have access inside the camp or outside the camp to formal jobs that are well paid with decent work conditions. So, um, so cash for work at the moment is, you know, compensating for that lack of access to stable and decent livelihood. Um, so as Kassim said, the prices sold uh, in the early days of the curfew in the camp and outside of camp as well, uh, mostly for staple food and mostly for fried fruits and vegetables. Uh, that changed, you know, from one week to the next or, or one day to the next, changed on the type of fruit or vegetables you're talking about or you're looking at. But that, you know, for a household that is barely making, let's say, uh, a couple hundred Jordanian dinars at the most uh, for every month for an entire household of three, four, five, six, eight people, uh, an increase for a kilo, I don't know, let's say, of tomatoes from 0.25 GD or 0.5 GD uh, to 0.7 GD is already something. So even though there was no acute food security issue in Zaatari, uh, there were problems in accessing basic, uh, basic items for a short period of time. And that so echoes, and I'm, I'm mindful of the time, but I'll, I'll move to recommendations soon, but that also has to be um, put into the broader context of what has been happening in, in, in Jordan as a whole uh, in terms of impact for COVID. Because, because the curfew was so, like the, the, the policy for curfew and confinement was so strict, all the daily workers, all the informal workers, uh, that is an important share of the Jordanian labor market, whether they are Jordanians or registered refugees, unregistered refugees, migrants, uh, foreign workers that are coming here for low skill labors, all these people could not access livelihood for about two months. And one of the consequences was these people who are the most vulnerable were also those who are the most likely to try to break curfews or confinement measures because they were trying to access livelihood regardless, uh, putting them at increased risk, at increased protection risk. And so currently the situation is improving. People can go back to work. Uh, informal workers can go back to their job. And even though, let's let be clear, like, you know, um, working conditions for low-skilled labor for informal workers is definitely not ideal and often worrying, whether you talk about agriculture, construction, um, certain services as well. Um, so people will need to make an income no matter what, and um, they will go back to those jobs knowing that they have been unable to make ends meet for about two months, knowing also that the government of Jordan was able really quickly to um, scale up social protection services for vulnerable Jordanians. But the ability for refugees outside the camp uh, to access aid in the first few weeks was uh, difficult because international organizations, national organizations as well, NGOs had to secure permits for their staff to access people, to access those communities, and that took a certain amount of time in the early days and the early weeks of the confinement. So it's been even more difficult for them. Um, now, in terms of recommendations, so the recommendations are covering two different aspects. So um, recommendations as a whole for the response in Jordan and recommendations for Zaatari camp and camp settings in general, also thinking about Azarak. When, when we look at the funding trends, um, that will probably be impacted by COVID. 
the, it is really important for the international community and that's very relevant for the UN, for international donors, that's very relevant as well for the Brussels conference to ensure that um, existing funding that are allocated to the response to the Sierra crisis in Jordan, whether, whether under the Jordan response plan or the 3RP, um, are not diverted to respond to COVID. And therefore funding that will be provided, future funding that will be provided for COVID or for the recovery after Jordan managed to overcome the pandemic are not diverted from existing funding channels but are, but are actually additional new funding streams um, so as to not impact the provision of essential services to vulnerable people in Jordan regardless of their nationality. Um, and also when you look at the aftermath of the crisis, because of the situation, the socioeconomic situation in which Jordan is in at the moment, COVID has shown, and that's also something that we are seeing across you know, the world, um, COVID has shown that it has you know, um, further increased the inequalities, existing inequalities, because the people who are the most impacted by COVID, beyond just getting sick, are those who are already the most vulnerable before the pandemic. And so there's a critical need now in Jordan, uh, just like probably everywhere else, to make sure that funding and programming is also available to address um, the causes of inequalities that have been uh, only, that have only increased because of the pandemic. Because otherwise the response to COVID-19 now is, on, is extremely necessary and vital, but is only sticking basically a small plaster on a more, on a bigger one, just if, if you allow me to use that, uh, that metaphor. And the last recommendation we have, um, and that's on our cash for work experience in Zatak, is there's a critical need, a critical need now in Zatali, but that applies to other camp settings as well, to, for donors to increase the funding for cash for work opportunities. So as I was explaining before, there's a limited number of work permits for Syrian refugees that are available. And uh, with, the current, with the current pandemic and the fact that you know, administrations had to shut down for a while, uh, there's now a backlog in treating the work, in, you know, in, in, in processing the new permits application, the renewal of permit applications. And so people will have probably to wait to get their new permit or the permit renewed. So when you look at the camp, because cash work is so important for people inside Zatari, uh, it is important to uh, increase funding for cash for work now and in the coming years because they provide vital uh, livelihood opportunities for people and, li and vital income and livelihood. That and when, when, when I say that, you need to be aware that most cash for work opportunities are occupied by men in Zatari camp. Only 38% of existing uh, IBV position, cash forward positions, are um, held by women. It's already bigger than anything in Jordan uh, outside of camps in terms of women participation to uh, the labor force. But that's still extreme, extremely low, knowing also that there's an important you know, share of, sing of female headed household in Zatari. Um, there's you know, important care needs for those women, whether taking care of ill people, old people, the children as well. So increasing funding for cash for work also means that provision must be given to providing opportunities for women, being mindful of the nature of the job, being mindful also not just of funding, but also activities that are, um, that in, that are aiming at um, changing social norms that are normally preventing women from joining the labor force. And also that are providing for care work for the children, for example, because the opportunities are quite limited in Zaatari, um, because all of that are, you know, uh, impeding women in their ability to seek labor, like work inside the camp. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, uh, Jean-Patrick and uh, Kasim. Thank you as well for uh, for uh, your flexibility and, and being here uh, with us today. Um, your uh, your presentation mainly stressing uh, the economic impacts um, on refugees now that uh, the 
um, the COVID crisis itself seems more or less contained uh, in, inside of uh, Jordan. So, but I think very important points uh, made there and also some very interesting uh, policy recommendations. Um, now I have to, to watch a bit the timing. So I will, have, I will immediately ask, the, ask, um, ask Jane Lineker from uh, Mixed Migration Center to, uh, to take the floor. Um, so Jane Lineker is uh, the global coordinator of 4MI, so the Mixed Migration Center's flagship uh, primary data collection project. Uh, she has uh, been in this uh, job since uh, 2019, uh, and so in April 2020, um, 4MI adapted its data collection to gather uh, specific information on uh, the, the experiences of refugees and migrants during the COVID crisis. So uh, they have conducted interviews with uh, over 4,000 people in 14 countries. Um, so Jane will be able to, to give us a more global view on the impact of COVID-19 on refugees um, in West Africa, East Africa, and North Africa. So Jane, please uh, go ahead. Hi, um, thanks very much for the opportunity to speak. And, uh, and here we go. Um, so I have a presentation. I hope the screen sharing is working because I'm going to have quite a lot of numbers. <laughs> so <laughs> easier to see than to, uh, to, to listen to sometimes. Um, so yeah, well, I'm going to zoom out a little bit from, from some of the themes that have been talked about um, so far. Um, looking at data that we've been collecting in three regions in Africa, looking at mixed migration, um, so looking at people on the move of um, all legal statuses. So, um, so to introduce a little bit the topic and, and who we are because of this shift in focus, I just want to briefly go through a little bit who uh, the Mixed Migration Centre is, um, what FireMI is, is doing. Um, so uh, then we'll talk a little bit about some of our findings so far. Um, so uh, just to introduce our understanding of mixed migration, so we're referring to cross-border movements of people. Um, including refugees, victims of trafficking, people seeking better lives and opportunities. So yeah, all the different legal statuses. Um, these are people who are generally, despite their different statuses, they're exposed to multiple rights violations, they follow similar paths um, and they have similar experiences, um, similar means to travel. So um, we use this lens to, to look at that population. Uh, the Mixed Migration Centre is a knowledge centre which is part of the Danish Refugee Council. Um, we focus on human rights and protection for people on the move and our aim is to inform um, evidence-based protection responses and policy. Um, we're a networked organisation of seven regional hubs, so I'm based in Geneva in the coordination unit but we have seven hubs across the regions um, of which you'll find more um, when we talk about uh, 4MI. So 4MI is um, called 4MI because its long name is the Mixed Migration Monitoring Mechanism Initiative. Um, it's been conducting continuous quantitative data collection with refugees and migrants on the move. Um, it started in 2014 and has grown uh, enormously since then. Um, before uh, the pandemic hit, we were conducting around a thousand face-to-face interviews per month in 15 countries. Uh, when the pandemic uh, was declared um, and uh, uh, protection measures uh, were put in place against COVID, um, our face-to-face -face interviews obviously came to a halt, but it was clear that this was impacting enormously on our population of interest. Um, so we uh, adapted uh, as quickly as we could to collect primary data on the impact crisis on the population that we research. Um, we already had our staff and the infrastructure in place thanks to the existing 4MI, so we simply changed our methodology um, to conduct remote recruitment of participants and interviews. We also built a new survey so that we could find out more about the impact of the pandemic and the measures taken to control it. Uh, obviously, it has some limitations. Um, we're recruiting our respondents remotely, which is not the easiest thing uh, in the world, um, but we're being creative and take, undertaking different uh, methods to do that, um, to try and control as much as we can for, for the biases that are involved there. Um, and it's not a random sampling, so um, it's important to bear in mind that our data is not representative of the full population. However, um, we collect a lot of data, 
Um, we do make huge efforts to be transparent in our methodology and to take account of bias. So what we think we can show and share, um, I think is, is useful and valuable. Um, so yeah, just to make sure we're, we're all aware of the, the limitations of what we're doing. So what the COVID survey um, that we're doing now is, is 70 questions covering knowledge and perceptions regarding the disease, um, access to healthcare, the impact on everyday life, income and needs, and impact on the actual migration journey and future plans. It was first rolled out in April and we've conducted more than 4,800 interviews so far. It's happening in uh, 13 countries at the moment. The ones that I'll focus on now are Burkina Faso, Mali, Niger. So that's a West Africa sample uh, in North Africa um, and in East Africa, in Kenya and Somalia, to be specific, in, in Somaliland. So that's what we'll be looking at here. Um, and just as an FYI for those who are interested, we're currently changing, revising the survey to, to look a lot more at rights um, and impact on, on migration as well as living conditions. So we're going to look at smuggling more on protection incidents and also on the journey and drivers of migration and whether COVID uh, is impacting on that. Um, hopefully, eventually, one day we'll be able to go back to face-to-face -face interviews where we can do things a bit more in depth. Um, but we'd still like to be able to track the longer term impacts of COVID or mobility. Okay, so now is where I start with, with all my graphs. Um, so first to look at um, the disease and, and protection against the disease amongst the population, uh, the sample that we're interviewing. Um, what is interesting is knowledge um, is quite high. Um, across all the regions, between 82 and 95 percent are taking measures against COVID-19 to protect themselves, um, although these vary, the types of measures vary enormously. Um, but it is important to note that uh, particularly in West Africa and East Africa, um, our respondents, 18 percent of respondents are not taking measures um, for a variety of reasons. Um, so around 40 percent are saying because they don't see the need to take measures but around the same figure are also saying um, it's because they can't, because they don't have access to, to the materials they need, um, such as masks, um, soap, sanitizer, et cetera. Um, the graph on the right, um, we ask if people can practice the 1.5 meter distancing where they're staying. Um, even in the best of cases in the regions we're looking at, um, it's only around two thirds that say they can. Um, and respondents in West Africa, uh, it's around one third that say they can. Um, we ask our respondents about access to health services and barriers to healthcare. Um, so this is a, a fairly high number, 64% um, in East Africa, 67 in North Africa, and 52% in West Africa say so they, so they don't. Uh, they can't access health services today, or they don't know if they can access health services today. The number is lower in West Africa, but it also has to be taken into account that a lot of our respondents are within ECOWAS, um, and the understanding was that they should be able to access it. So, uh, so um, that's all quite striking uh, results. When we ask people what the barriers are, um, you can see on the right hand side that money is the most reported barrier to um, healthcare. Um, but so um, also many just don't know where to go. Um, this varies quite a lot. Um, discrimination is a considerable barrier, particularly in North Africa at 36%. It was very high amongst our sample of respondents in Tunisia. And insecurity is, is only really reported in, in Libya, very little elsewhere. Um, to move on to impact on day-to-day -day life, um, the, mm, a lot of respondents um, record a uh, report of reduced access to work, which reflects what everybody's talking about. It's, it's way over half of all our respondents in all our regions. Um, stress and anxiety, um, additional stress and anxiety is clearly an issue for, for the majority of respondents. Um, but there's also, it's, uh, the percentages are smaller, but, but nonetheless serious issues are, are um, impact on access to asylum, 
which is um, up to 19% in East Africa and 18% in North Africa, um, as well as some increase in um, uh, racism and, and xenophobia. And this was particularly reported in North Africa and again in Tunisia. Um, when we look at loss of income, um, so the, the percentages uh, reporting loss of income are around about half of our respondents, but it's important to note that this includes those who are um, uh, who weren't uh, accessing income in the first place. So this is just, a, um, if we looked at the actual percentage of those who are earning an income before, it would be much, much higher. Um, those who report loss of income and the impact it's having, um, you can see the heavy impact on access to basic goods, um, although um, it's, uh, it's low in, uh, in West Africa, so my comment is a bit wrong on that one. But, um, but it's much higher in North Africa and East Africa than in West Africa. Um, and we all can, so can see an impact on remittances, which has been reported elsewhere. Um, and we can see it in the responses from, from our interviews. The impact on needs, um, we have 86% of respondents needing extra assistance. So this is a fairly complex graph, but if you look at the lines, these are those reporting that they need extra assistance and the type of extra assistance that they need. This number, this percentage, is fairly consistent across all of the regions where we're conducting interviews, and it's been fairly consistent uh, across time since we started um, in mid-April. Uh, equally consistent has been the number who've received extra assistance, so that's only at 20% in comparison. Um, these are the bars in the, uh, in the graphs. Um, and you can see that cash, um, there's a little bit of a gap um, of the demand for cash and those receiving cash, which I think is reflected in what other people have been saying. If we look at the impact on mobility and migration plans, clearly there's been a, an impact on crossing borders. So uh, it, the difference in the percentages here, I think is a reflection on the, the mobility of the sample. Um, so our West African respondents are far more dynamic, so they're more um, citing issues with crossing borders. Um, but you'll see that those who are stuck, it's still quite a high number. Uh, important to pay attention to because of the risk of increasing vulnerability um, with this uh, stuck population. So I would like to close up um, with quite a few recommendations which come from this data. Um, access to health services without fear of being reported um, is, is extremely important. Um, safeguarding the right to seek asylum, assistance programs that must include refugees and migrants, um, and the need for cash, I think it should be noted. Um, access to information, while knowledge about the disease seems to be relatively high, um, information on where services can be accessed and how they can be accessed um, is, is, is not so high. Um, xenophobia and racism is increasing somewhat in some places more than others and should be addressed. Um, and there are existing commitments about remittances to improve the means to, to send them and, and these should be acted upon because they're becoming more and more important now, especially with the cost of them. Um, and that's it. I've gone through fairly quickly um, because of time. So <laughs> I'm sure there are questions. Um, thank you very much. Uh, we've got a lot more publications going into more depth for particular areas if you're interested in particular locations. Thanks. Okay, uh, thank you so much, uh, Jane, for, for this information and an update on very recent uh, data information that gave somehow uh, a bit more of a global uh, global scope on, on what we discussed before and also good to see that a lot of the recommendations that you did are shared by, uh, by the speakers that, uh, um, that spoke before you. Um, so I think that's good that we do see some, some agreement on this as well. 
Um, and so uh, thank you, Jane, but thank you as well from, from my side to all of the, the other uh, panelists. Thank you, Vincent, Noor, Kassim, and Jean-Patrick. Um, and so if I can take like one uh, major or one common message from all of the presentations, then it is that the, the COVID crisis only increased some of the inequalities that have uh, existed already long before the COVID crisis. Um, and that COVID has exposed some of the, the major weaknesses as well in, in our global system of refugee protection. Um, and so uh, that leads us to, to, we have to, I think we have to learn from, uh, from this crisis and, and take some lessons in how we can, uh, we can fix uh, these weaknesses, so that never waste a good crisis. Um, so with that, I leave it from my side here today. Thank you to all the, the panelists. Um, and thank you as well to, to the participants. I see that there have been uh, a lot of questions uh, asked in the chat box, but also uh, Mr. Questel has answered uh, some of them and, and, and provided some, some interesting links there as well, I see. Uh, but I will, I will pass the floor now to my colleague Cecile, uh, who will do a wrap up of, of these questions and then moderate a, kind of a Q&A between all of you. Yes, hello everyone. Uh, in fact, Mr. Kochel has already answered uh, at all questions and more too. So uh, you have the answer in the chat box. Uh, I think uh, we can use the, the rest of the time to uh, new questions, if they are. No. Oh, there is no more questions, I think. Um, ah, yes, a question for Jean-Patrick. Uh, sir, you have mentioned that the Syrian workers have limited work permits. Do you mean the ones in the camp or overall? It's a question for Jean-Patrick. I think you can answer to these questions uh, by yes jean patrick you have the flow jean patrick are you there <laughs> ah, I uh, hello it seems ah, yes. uh, jp has an issue of uh, his computer i will be able to answer this question uh, the, the work permits for the, the the refugees living in host community and camps for both. Okay, thank you. A questions from Samir. Um, Mr. Koshtel, any idea about the number of migrants that are entering in Libya recently? I've understood that people are still coming to Libya. Minister, yes. 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 No, we think there are people still coming mainly from uh, Niger and Chad, less from Sudan because of the expulsion that are taking place from a city called Al Kufra in northeast uh, Libya back into Sudan. And we don't have much information about movement uh, from Egypt. The border with Tunisia is closed, so it's difficult to quantify the movement. We believe that there are still movement. We don't know to what extent uh, those numbers are similar to before the COVID or not. Over. Okay, thank you very much. Apologies, uh, Jean-Patrick here. Apologies, uh, my computer was blocked for a few minutes. So if I could just expand a bit on, on the response that, that Kassim um, gave. And thank you, Kassim, by the way. Um, so <coughs> Syrian workers, so under the Jordan uh, Compact, there was, I think, um, an objective of about 200,000 work permit to be issued for Syrian workers. Uh, the, the objective is almost reached, but um, so, you ha so what's happening is uh, 
the work permit system for Syrian workers and in general is fairly complex, meaning um, you have different permits for different sectors and those are one year long uh, sector specific work permit. Syrians can only work within the realm of certain sectors and more often than not, these are uh, open for low skilled labor. Uh, there are also cash for work, specific cash for work work permit that are issued for host communities, for work in host communities, and they are specific for Syrians. Other nationalities cannot, uh, non Syrian non refugees cannot access those work permits. So at the moment, those permits are on hold uh, because of lockdown and because of administrative procedures, uh, meaning that Syrian workers cannot in certain places work in ca or do cash for work activities legally in certain governorate of Jordan, um, which is impacting obviously uh, the ability to access livelihoods and also which could in return also push them to go into informal work. Um, so these are like the trends that we are seeing. Uh, and also you have, and what's something that I was saying earlier is the number of cash work permits that are available to Syrians or that, or that have been issued to Syrians since uh, the, the, the work permit program for Syrian refugees started doesn't necessarily mean that having a work permit will ensure that Syrian refugees will have access to formal work for the, because of the reasons of um, increasing you know, informality that I was talking about earlier. Um, so it doesn't mean as well that they will have access to social protection because of the MOI cards, the Ministry of Interior cards that they may have, or that they will have social protection and social security through the employment that they will get. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, there is a question uh, about the refugees in Morocco. I don't know uh, which of you want to answer at these questions? Perhaps Jane, or I don't know. It's a question from Radija. Hi, um, I'm, uh, Forma is not collecting data in Morocco at the moment, so we don't have any okay. actual data, sorry. But we'd like to. <laughs> uh -huh. Uh, yes, Vincent here. We started collecting data. Uh, we are conducting a survey targeting 600 households. The information should be available at the end of the month. Um, what we know is at this stage only indicative figure 50% of refugees have lost their uh, livelihood. Um, again, same pattern that we see in many North African countries because refugees are not in camp. Uh, they, they're really uh, losing all opportunities and there are no, uh, let's say, social safety net in terms of assistance uh, for them. So I think many speakers have emphasized the importance of, uh, you know, um, cash allowance, uh, cash for works program. Uh, a reinforcement of the, the livelihood program is essential. The earlier we do it, the better we um, get those people out of the poverty line on vulnerability zone. Okay. Are there any other questions? I don't know who wants to, to speak again, intervenant or participant. And if there are no more questions, uh, I rise to thank you speakers and all participants. Fro, it's... Yes, if, uh, if there are no more questions, then we, we, can, uh, we can leave it here. Then we end uh, just five minutes uh, before the, the time that we, uh, we planned in advance, but I think that's a, that's a good thing. Um, so I would like to thank again all of the participants and especially all of the speakers uh, for taking uh, the time to, uh, for the presentations here today and to answer to all of uh, these questions. Uh, then maybe one last thing that this, was, uh, this webinar was part of a series of four uh, sessions that uh, we are organizing on COVID-19 and migration. Uh, so there is one last um, 
session that we are planning and it will be on uh, um, labor migration and remittances uh, and the impact of COVID-19. So it has been mentioned by several speakers today that the impact of uh, COVID-19 is uh, has a huge impact and dramatic impact in, in terms of drop in remittances. And so our next webinar will really uh, focus on this aspect as well. Um, but we do not have yet a, a planned date, but it will probably be end of uh, June. So, but we will send this uh, invitation to, to all of the participants here today. Um, so I will leave it at that and, uh, and thank you again to, to everyone.